Flying All Cars, a presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars, broadcast 60 regarding a stick-up. A gang of six men just held up the Kreitzer Creamery. That's all. Rose and Quist. Attention all cars. Go to an independent service station selling Rio Grande cracked gasoline. There's one in your neighborhood. Learn why more police cars in California and Arizona use Rio Grande cracked than any other gasoline. For the same price as ordinary gasoline, Rio Grande cracked with tetraethyl gives you police car performance. That's all. Now it is our pleasure to introduce to you Captain Harry Seeger, in command of the robbery and narcotic squads of the Los Angeles Police Department. Captain Seeger. Good evening, friends. We whose life work it is to keep the peace have all heard ourselves called dumb coppers and big flat feet. Our reaction to such epithets is not, as might be supposed, one of anger, but one of tolerant amusement. The average police officer each day is called upon to employ more practical psychology than many a professor of psychology has ever dreamed existed. The modern policeman uses his brains much more often than he uses his gun. He is a highly trained specialist, as capable and important a member of society as is your dentist or your lawyer or your doctor. The story we are bringing you tonight from our confidential files is an excellent example of the way to the men under Chief Davis's command, faced possible death with their wits. It is late in the afternoon of April Fool's Day in 1928. The delivery men for the Kreutzer Creamery have one by one turned in their receipts, punched the time clock, and left for their homes. Mr. Kreutzer's secretary is eyeing the clock as it slowly ticks off the last half hour of their day when two men carrying guns shoulder into the office, closely followed by three more. Stick them up. <coughs> Stay where you are and keep quiet. Well... What's this, an April Fool joke? No, it ain't no April Fool joke. Pick them up. Hi. Now, you two face the wall and keep your hands up. We don't want any trouble. But if anybody tries to pull a fast one, these two rod men here will chop you down. Okay, kid, let's get the dough out of that cage. There isn't any money in there. It's wrapped up in the safe. Don't hand me that. You don't put it in the safe until 5.30. All right, kid, hurry it up. And I'm getting it as fast as I can. Dump it all into this bag. That's fine. Have we looked at anything? No, I don't think so. Okay, let's go. I'll get this, you two. If you care anything for a living, just stay where you are facing that wall for five minutes. There'll be a man outside with a gap right on you, and you'll let you have it if you move. Come on, boys. Longer. Uh, do you suppose there's really someone outside? Sure there is. They were tough guys. Well, well, I think they were just bluffing. And, and anyway, my arms are getting tired. Better do as he said. I I'm just going to take a take a little look. Don't. I hear footsteps. He's heard us talking. He's coming back to shoot us. Well, for the love of Mike, what's the big idea? You two playing games? Oh, it's you, Harry. Say, is there anyone standing around outside? No one I noticed. What's the matter? Give me that phone quick. We've been robbed.
It is a matter of minutes before detectives Joe Loquat and Eddie Chitwood of the Los Angeles Robbery Squad have arrived at the creamery. They question Mr. Kreutzer closely on the circumstances of the holdup. Now, how much do you estimate they got, Mr. Kreutzer? Well, I hadn't checked up yet, but every driver was accounted for excepting Harry Kerr, who came in after the holdup. I should say between $1,000 and $1,500. Yeah, that's bad, not bad. If they'd only come ten minutes later, I'd have had the money locked away in the safe. And if they'd have come a half hour earlier, it wouldn't have been turned in yet. Knew your movements pretty well, eh? Yes, and a funny thing happened. I tried to bluff them that I'd already locked the money up. And this man who did all the talking said he knew I didn't put it in the safe until 5.30. Looks like an inside job, eh, Andy? Sure does, Joe. Mr. Kreutzer, have you any reason to suspect that one of your employees was in on this? Why, no. Not any of my boys. They're all honest. Uh, maybe so. You'll admit, Mr. Kreutzer, that these hold-up men knew an awful lot about you for strangers, didn't they? Yes. But still, I'd stake anything that none of my boys were in on it. Well, uh, possibly you're right. But in our business, we're suspicious of everybody. I think, Mr. Kreutzer. Is there one of your employees that puts on a dog of it? Well, what do you mean? Well, spends a little more than he should with the salary he makes, for instance. Maybe wears expensive clothes or throws away a lot of dough on women. Mm, no. I can't think of anyone. Take your time, Mr. Kreutzer, and think carefully. Well, there is Harry. He drives a pretty swell new eight-cylinder Studebaker. Who's Harry? He's one of the fellows who came in a while ago and found us holding up our hands. He's got a big new sedan. Well, how much salary does he make? I pay him $26 a week. He buys a new Studebaker on $26 a week. That don't make sense. Harry's a steady fellow. Married and got two kids. He wouldn't be mixed up in anything. And did it ever occur to you that he couldn't begin to make payments on a car like that in support of a family on $26 a week? Why, no, it didn't. The fact that he came in after the holdup might mean something. Well, I'm sure you're wrong about Harry. Well, it's the only tangible lead we have. Tomorrow we'll follow Harry when he leaves here. In the meantime, Mr. Kreutzer, just don't say anything to anyone about our plans, will you? <laughs> The next day, Kitwood parked his own car near the creamery that passed us through it. Shortly after five o'clock, he sees the suspected Harry Kerr drive out of the creamery yard in a new Studebaker sedan. Kitwood follows the new car across town to a rooming house on East First Street, where Kerr parks. Sauntering into the house behind the suspect, Kitwood observes that he enters room 16. He immediately calls on the landlady. Yeah, that is it. I'd like some information about the tenants of room 16. That is it you want to know about them? Well, who occupies the room? Well, I don't know exactly who lives there. Quite a number of young men go in and out. Yes, but someone must have signed for it. Who is that? I don't know whether I should be telling you this. Who are you? I'm a police officer. Oh, I see. Uh, what are they up to for? Oh, nothing yet. Just making a little investigation. Tell me, do these young men have jobs? Well, not so you could tell. They keep their regular hours. Do they pay their rent regularly? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't have no trouble with them that way. How many young men come in and out of that room? Well, I should say five or six. Any girls? Hey, what sort of a place do you think I run here? <laughs> don't get excited. I'm not trying to pin anything on you. I want to find out about these guys, and you might just as well help me as not. Well, uh, yeah, there are two girls who spend a lot of time in there. Hmm. Now, who's the man whose name this apartment is registered? Uh, his name is uh, Bob Kerr. Sure it isn't Harry Kerr. No, no. Harry Kerr's his brother. He mm. comes here sometimes. Know the names of any of the others? Yeah, I do. Okay, I get this. I'll be back a little later. While I'm gone, don't tell anybody that I was here. Above all, don't let those people in 16 know that I asked you all these questions. Yeah, yeah. Remember now, keep quiet, because you're playing with dynamite. Yeah. Chitwood hastens to headquarters to get his partner, Joe Loquat. Together they return to the rooming house and cautiously approach the door to room 16. Put on a limber your gat, Joe. You can't tell what we'll have run into. Okay. You all set? All set. Let her ride. Come on, come on. Come on. Go on, open up or we'll break the door in, will you? Just try to open it first. All right. Oh, you're flashing here, Joe. Oh, there's son of a gun. He flung the coop. Beat it, huh? How in the devil? 
Hey, I've only been away from the spot long enough to go up and get you. Hey, I'll bet that landlady. Hey, landlady! Landlady! Oh, there you are. That is it, you land. These people have gone. Taking everything with them. Gone? Gone and took my beautiful painting of the Canal of Venice with them? Why, the ungrateful wretches cost me two dollars that picture. Now, wait just a minute. I want to know who tipped them off. What are you looking at me for? I had nothing to do with it. I did yes, as you said. I didn't go near them. You sure about that? Yeah. So I should have done them to move out. They were paying the rent. Well, all right, all right. No good crying about it. Let's take a look around, Joe. If they left anything, they might give us a clue. Okay. Don't look like they left a thing, Eddie. Cupboards are empty. Nothing in the clothes closet. What about the desk drawers? Nothing there. Hey, wait a minute. There's something under this table cover. Yeah, what? A little notebook. A giveaway from a dollar down two pants suit joint. And a pen? Oh, it's brand new. Hmm. Look at the pages. <laughs> Unless they're really this with invisible ink, we're up against it. Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Telephone number here in the center of the book. The prospect number. Uh, probably the number of a beanery or a house. Yeah, maybe. But it's the only thing we've got to go on, so let's trace it down. Chitwood and Loquat begin at once to trace down the mysterious phone number. Through the cooperation of the telephone company, they discover that the phone is located at a rooming house near the corner of 12th Street and Grand Avenue. They immediately drive to the spot and park their car across the street from the rooming house. Well, Joe, this may be a screwy wild goose chase. Just what are we looking for? I don't know. We'll keep our eyes glued on that spot across the street and see what happens. Yeah, but we're not even sure that these guys have anything to do with that uh, crutch of creamer holdup. Anybody's got a right to pull out of a room so long as they're not ducking the bill. Yeah, that's right enough. I just got a hunch on this thing. This guy Kerr, who works out at the creamery, drives a Studebaker 8 on $26 a week. He beats it over to that joint on First Street after work, and I find out from the landlady that the room is rented by his brother. Doesn't prove anything. I know it doesn't, but it's worth working on. We haven't anything else to work on, have we? No, that's true enough. Well, let's get over there and talk to the landlady. Yeah, not this time, Joe. I'm not taking any more landladies into my confidence on this case. Oh, that dame didn't tip them off. She was on the level. Well, maybe she was, and maybe she wasn't. We haven't anything to talk to this landlady about anyway. All we have is a telephone number of her joint. Yeah, no idea who we're looking for. I guess you're right. Now, the way I figured... Oh, wait a minute. What? There it is. Well, there what is? Studebaker sedan. Just pulled up in front of the place. You see it? Yeah. I'm not so sure this leader get us somewhere. Come on. Let's follow that bird and see where he goes. Careful to avoid being seen, Detective Chitwood and Loquat follow the strange driver of the Studebaker into the rooming house up a rickety staircase, and along an ill-smelling hall, which is badly illuminated by a feeble electric bulb. They observe which room the man enters, and then they cautiously approach the door. Is that the guy from the creamery? No, but it was the same car. Must have been Kerr's brother. Tough-looking customer. Sure was. On your toes now, Joe. Anything might happen. Listen, you can hear what they're saying in there. Let's get all the stuff out of that other joint. Yeah, sure thing, Bob. Good. Uh, what was the big idea of pulling the plate so quick? Oh, I just smelled a beef. What do you mean, smell a beef? You've been on the racket as long as I have, kid. You'll get so you can just feel it in your bones when the stuff is about to break again, sir. I don't get you. But you keep them both hanging around that first three joints? Oh, but well, I ain't so bad a hug. Don't sound like stick-up artist to me. Might be anything. Let's get a load of this. Yeah, I'm glad to get out of that dump anyway. That landlady was too nice. I don't trust landladies who aren't suspicious. Yeah, that's right. Got any ideas for the next job, Bob? Huh? Yeah, I've been giving them some thought. You know that bank just around the corner ought to be up to the Now, what do you think, Joe? Maybe you're uh, right. Too many people out there. Yeah, but they're going places fast. They're in automobiles. They're not driving the sidewalk. When would you knock them over? Well, about a quarter to three some afternoon, and they've got lots of dough in the bills. Well, I figure that we can take plenty of time chasing the joint. And so we got at the crazy after they will take us for a couple of weeks. You're right, Eddie. These are our guys. Uh, you better stay here while I'll go get some more men from headquarters. Yeah, and by that time, maybe they'll all take it on the lamb again. Well, what do you want to do? We'll take them ourselves. You're crazy, Eddie. There's five or six of them in there and only two of us. 
Why, they'd make sieves out of us. Well, not if you use psychology on them. Psychology? What good is psychology when you got a rat holding an automatic up against you? Psychology's helped me out of spots before. You like the time you had them Japs up on top of the hill? Oh, maybe. Well, you were just lucky that time. I'm going back to headquarters with some more of the boys. Listen here, Joe. The last time we closed in on a mob, we had about 20 of the boys all around the joint. A couple of them nearly got bumped off when the shooting started. There's no sense in risking anybody else's neck. We can handle this. Well, I don't see how you and I are going to manage a mob like that. First, we've got to get a break. Once I can get inside, I'll look the place over and then decide what to do. Listen, that it. Those guys are tough. Ah, no, they're not. I can outsmart them. All I need is a break. Hey, quiet. Somebody's opening the door. Look back here around the corner of the hall. Hey, where are you going, Sam? I'm just going downstairs for a pack of cigarettes. Yeah, well, don't let no big bad policeman pick you up, kitty. Uh, don't <laughs> worry. I can take care of myself. That's our break, Joe. What do you mean, Eddie? When that monkey comes back with his cigarettes, I'm going to follow him in as though I was with him. And get bumped off? Yeah, we'll see. I'm gambling that every one of these mugs will think I'm a pal of the other one. I'll say prayers for you. No, you won't. You'll be right there by the door. When I say, shoot the works, you wander in. Have your gun ready, but keep it out of sight. And this is what you call psychology? Yep. I call it suicide. Tensely, the two officers wait in the dimly lit hall for the return of Stan. Eternal minutes slowly pass. Then they hear footsteps on the stairs. See the young gunman swagger down the hall. Chitwood suddenly claps Joe on the shoulder and steps out into the passage. As Stan approaches the door, Chitwood passes him. And then, as the young man enters the room, the detective shoulders in behind him. Five pairs of tough eyes focus on Chitwood. Stan wheels, surprised. The detective quickly takes in the room. His trained eyes see six guns stacked on the dresser across the room. Smiling pleasantly, he starts across the room to that all-important position in front of the dresser. Twelve hard eyes follow him. Uh, Why don't you lazy bums get out and go to work? Fine bunch of believers you are laying around the room all day. I'll be ashamed of yourselves. Don't tell me you can't get jobs because that's a lot of the well-known hooey. Say, you go. Who the devil is this bird? I don't know. I thought it was a pal of yours. Uh, I never saw him before. Must know one of the guys. He acts like he belonged here, all right? He gives me the jitters. Well, well, well. Six toy pistols all stacked on the dresser. <laughs> Might as well park mine, too. Hey, you are. Shoot the works. You dim-witted sap, Stan. Why'd you bring this guy back with you? I didn't bring him back. He muscled in. I thought he was a pal of yours. He is not. Hey, look. There's another one just opened the door. This looks like a beef to me. Well, what are you so solemn about? Let's have some entertainment. You act like this is a funeral. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you fortunes. I'll begin with Stan here, who just brought back the cigarettes. Mind if I have one, Stan? Uh oh, uh oh, oh. Not so near those guns. Thanks. Relax, boys. Smoke. Do anything you like. Listen to your fortunes. Let's start with Stan here. As I gaze into the crystal bowl, I see that. Stan's got ambitions. He's a dreamer. He sees himself toting a rod, earning himself a reputation as a chopper. Stan's future is a strange one. He's going on a journey to a northern summer resort. It's a big gray building. From Stan's window, he'll be able to look across the bay and watch the ferry boats and the steamers come and go. He's going to stay there a nice long time, whether he likes it or not. I charge you for that, Stan. More accurate than most of the fortunes you pay money for. Well, let's see. Who's next? Oh, you'll do fine. Now, you look like the head man of this outfit. You're tough. You mean business. You'd rather shoot first and talk about it afterwards. As a matter of fact, I can read your mind. You're thinking right now, if you could get to those guns here on the dresser, you'd shoot me. I advise you not to try it. It wouldn't be healthy. You can't tell about that fellow standing over there by the door. He might be a hard guy himself. For you, my tough friend, I see a most interesting picture. Dawn. In a gray courtyard, there is a high wooden platform. Thirteen steps rise to it. With a strange beam above it. With a neatly tied rope attached. I see you walking up those steps. I see a man placing a strange piece of black velvet over your head. I see... All right, all right, lay off, will you? Oh. A mistake on that one. You're not as tough as I thought you were. Well, let's go on to the next. The 
lad over here is a likely subject. He thinks he's tough, too. Swaggers and he leers and scowls. He really isn't tough. He's scared to death right now. He isn't tough at all. It'd be a long journey for him, too. I see him living in a gray stone apartment. There are bars at the windows. I see him trying to act tough for the man in charge of his quarters. He's trying to live up to his own opinion of himself. For that, he's removed from the light. He spends many days in a cool cellar. He feasts on bread and water. And he thinks. Thinks constantly of his mother. Down in his heart, he realizes that he isn't really tough. He had no right tying up with this mob of lazy mugs. He sits in his sunless solitude <laughs> and breaks his heart, trying to undo the things that he has done. Bring back the past. Go back to his mother. The only person in the world who ever cared anything about him. <laughs> All right, Joe. This boss has gone on long enough. Drop your braces on those two over there by the door. I'll link up this pair here. What are you going to do with the other two? Keep my gun on them. Okay, kid, cut that top stuff. All right, you mugs. File out and get down on the street. And remember, I have won more turkeys at the Chief's Thanksgiving turkey shoot than any man on the force. Shuffling along the dark hill and down the creaky stairs, the strange procession makes its way to the street. Chetwood herds them toward the Studebaker sedan parked by the entrance. Maybe we can't ever get all those guys into headquarters. Let me call for the wagon. It won't be necessary, Joe. I know how to pack them, all right. Okay. You two that are cuffed together. Into the back seat with you. Come on, push over there to the left. Now you, without the handcuffs, sit beside them. Go on, get going. Hey, what's this all about? Save your breath. Get in there. All right. Next two with handcuffs, climb in and sit on his lap. Hey, listen, he's too heavy. That's fine. He'll keep you from pulling any funny business. Go on, get in. Fine. That leaves Stan. You drive this car, Stan? Yeah, I suppose Good. so. You drive. Joe, you sit in the front seat with Stan. You get this, Stan. Joe will have his gun on you all the way to headquarters. You'll go straight over Grand Avenue to Temple Street, straight down Temple to Central Station. You'll drive at 10 miles an hour. I'll be in the police car right behind you. You'll have all your gats in the front seat beside me. I'll be driving with my bumper right up against yours. Stan... You veer out of line or swing to the right or left one inch, I'll let you have it from behind. I won't care if the bullets knock off one of you guys in the back seat on the way. Of course, sir. Before I'd be able to get a sight on you, Joe would probably bump you off. That's the way it stands. You all understand? Yeah, we get it. Okay. All set, Joe? Yeah. Let's go, then. In just a minute, Eddie. I want to ask you something. Where is it, Joe? Is this psychology? Well, yeah. Sort of applied psychology. Yeah? Guess I'd better study up on it. The next day, all six men confessed not only to the Kreutzer Creamery robbery, but to a string of stick-ups in San Diego, Bakersfield, Taft, and as far north as San Francisco. They were tried on a charge of first-degree robbery. Four of them were sentenced to San Quentin prison from five years to life. Two of them beat the rap. So we sent one of the survivors to San Quentin for from one to 15 years on an old forgery charge and turned the other over to the Navy where he was sentenced for two years for desertion. There is a deplorable aspect to this story that I want to point out to the citizens of the West. Although six years ago, four of these men were sentenced to prison, four from five years to life. Today, due to the sentimental parole system under which we suffer in the state of California, these four dangerous, habitual criminals have already been released, and we have certain knowledge that at least two of them have returned to their old haunts in Los Angeles. Thus, the brave work Captain Chitwood did when he and his partner, Joe Loquat, brought these men in, must again be repeated by your police officers, and the next time, possibly some officer will pay... Thank you, Captain Seeger. Mr. Lindley. Yes, Mr. Buchanan, what is it? Mr. <laughs> Grandy has asked me to have you read this letter. A letter? Oh. This one? From Mr. and Mrs. F. 
P. Bender, 61 State Street, San Francisco. Uh, rather nice handwriting, isn't it? Well, let's see what it says. For years, we have had cars in our family and have used all the leading gasolines. We have been driving a Dodge E632 sedan, quite a heavy car, and heretofore, the most mileage ever received has been from 13 to 14 miles per gallon. On Sunday, we took our usual trip and for the first time used Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And believe me when I say that we were the most surprised motorists to learn that we received 18 miles to the gallon. How do you think of that? Well, let's see. Uh, Rio Grande gives them five more miles per, ga uh, per gallon. Not bad, is it? Well, anyway, she goes on to say here, now we know the gasoline for us and intend to pass the word along. This is not written for any reason other than to express our appreciation. And it is the absolute truth. Well, uh, that's an interesting letter, Mr. Buchanan. Well, it sounds almost too perfect to me. Are you sure one of your friends didn't write it? Uh, I'm afraid some of the audience might be dubious, so I wrote to Mr. and Mrs. Bender in San Francisco and asked the permission to read the letter. And here's their answer. Your letter asking to read our expression of appreciation received. We assure you it's quite all right with us. Glad if our letter means a help to Rio Grande, for Rio Grande has helped us. We wish you success. Yes, I guess that is a genuine testimonial, all right. But there must be hundreds of motorists listening tonight who have even more pleasant experiences with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Will you folks write to the Rio Grande Oil Company, care of the station to which you are listening, and tell us what you think about Rio Grande cracked? I want to read your letters over the air. If you haven't yet tried Rio Grande, fill up and enjoy the thrill of police car performance. You will find plenty to write about. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 60 regarding a stick-up. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and close. Did you get your free copy of the sensational new publication, The Calling All Cars News? The demand was so great after last week's broadcast that many Rio Grande stations ran out of these free copies. Don't miss this first issue. Go to the Rio Grande dealer near you and get your copy of Calling All Cars News. It's free and full of news about police, crime, movies, radio. It reveals the true story of the ghetto kidnapped. 